Hi everybody. Step two. Once that foundation is laid with proper eating and sleep structure, now we can focus on eating intuitively. Step two, eating intuitively. What does that mean? Well, it means eating a little bit more mindfully, paying attention to those internal cues of hunger and satiety that honestly we're conditioned over the course of our lives to pay less and less attention to. This is an extremely important step. It will be helpful to you after surgery in many ways. Today, I'm gonna to review just the top two. First, eating mindfully is going to help you identify those sometimes subtle cues of satiety that you're going to be receiving after surgery that will be different than those sensations of fullness that you might be feeling now. It will allow you to avoid discomfort after surgery. If you have any friends who maybe have had this procedure and you're having a meal with them and you see that they're eating slow and they're chewing their food well and they're doing their thing and all of a sudden they may do something like this and say, I'm done. That means that they took one or, bite, one or two more bites past where they honestly should have. So listening to these hunger cues, paying attention to eating intuitively will allow you the ability to put that fork down feeling comfortable, not feeling pressure or discomfort at the end of your meal. Second, eating intuitively or mindfully will help you identify times where you might be eating and hunger is not the reason at all. And we all do this, right, to a certain extent. We eat for reasons that have nothing to do with hunger every day. We eat when we're bored, we eat when we're tired, when we're happy, when we're sad for comfort and soothing and stress reduction. Being able to identify when that's happening and specifically the, the emotions or the cues that are putting you in that position is the first step in replacing food as a coping strategy. So listening to these internal cues will help you both maintain a level of comfort after surgery, stop at a feeling of, of uh, I'm just okay, as opposed to pressure. And it will also be the first step in identifying emotional eating patterns. So how do we do this? I developed this scale uh, as a quick and easy way for you to just think about hunger and, and satiety or fullness a little differently. So if you focus on this scale of zero to 10, where zero is starving, 10 is full, over full, Five, right in the middle, neutral, not one way or the other. Three and seven are my magic numbers. Three is comfortably hungry. Hungry, for sure, below the neck, internal sensation, telling me that I need to eat. It's nothing dramatic. If I'm busy running around, I can easily dismiss it. Wind up a couple hours later, very hungry over there at, at zero or one. Seven, on the other end of the scale, also subtle. This is, I'm just okay, content and satisfied. Could I eat more? Sure. Do I need to? No, I'm okay. Most people identify seven being at a restaurant after they've had maybe a piece of bread, salad, share an appetizer before the entree even hits the table. If I were to tap them on the shoulder in that moment and ask them, not are you full yet, but are you still hungry, really, down here? Most people, if they thought about it honestly, would say absolutely not but here comes my entree, so please get out of my way. Then even if they eat half of it, they're still ending their meal somewhere around eight, nine, or 10. Ideally, I would like you to practice bouncing yourself between three and seven. You should be eating a meal in response to some type of physical hunger and ending your meal, not when you're full or when the food is gone, but ending your meal when you're just content, satisfied, no longer physically hungry. This is harder than it sounds for sure. Um, in my experience, I find that people tend to either fall into one of two categories. Either they bounce themselves between zero and 10. These are my meal skippers. So these are folks, I'm busy all day long. I'm not hungry in the morning, busy all day long. Maybe I'll have a handful of pretzels at some point during my day and then I have a, a large meal in the evening. Because they start that large meal at zero or one, I'm starving. Generally don't make a great choice. Eat too fast, too much fly right by seven before they ever knew that they were there and wind up ending up at eight, nine, or 10. And you have my other group, my snackers. They tend to bounce themselves between five and 10. They really don't allow themselves to get hungry. They will just eat when they are no longer full to again achieve fullness. Um, equally detrimental, honestly, after surgery. So we wanna make sure that you are bouncing yourself between three and seven. Specifically, what you wanna take a look at this when you're looking at the snacks. We've discussed breakfast, lunch, and dinner, three consistent meals important. 
So this is not an excuse to skip a meal. If you say, well, I'm not really hungry. Uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner have to happen. But I wanna make sure that you're paying attention to ending your meal comfortably. Practice this now. It will take more food, certainly, than it will once you have this procedure. But if you get into the habit of putting that fork down with room to go, you're more likely to put that fork down with a state of comfort after the procedure. Don't think of full as the goal. There really is no such thing as full after surgery. There's content and satisfied, and then there's uncomfortable. And no one wants you ending your meal uncomfortable. So practice now. Maybe put half the amount of food on your plate that you would typically, and ask yourself at that halfway point, how do I feel now? Where am I on that scale? Am I okay? Am I still hungry? Do I need more, or am I okay? Am I good? You will, in thinking about this, wind up organically, without even trying to eat less or cut portion, you're gonna wind up cutting about 15, 20% off of your meal. It's great for the preoperative weight loss that, that the insurance companies and the surgeons desire, but most importantly, from my perspective, you're helping yourself develop that habit of not looking for full as the goal. Content and satisfied is the goal, right? The other component that paying attention to this scale will, will provide to you, the benefit that it will provide to you, is being able to take the first steps in identifying when you're eating and hunger is not the reason. So as you're thinking about this hunger scale, if you are having lunch at noon and at 1.30 you find yourself in the kitchen or in the office break room grabbing a handful of pretzels, stop and ask yourself why. Are you physically hungry or are you looking? More often than not, it's because we are looking. So I think that this is a big difference, a, a big um, pullback from typical dieting. Typical dieting will say, you want to eat between meals, you desire a snack, even if it is just because you're bored or tired or happy or sad, just have something healthy. Have a rice cake or have pretzels, it's better than a cookie, or have um, you know fruit, it's better than chips. That might be true in terms of the health component, but if you are not physically hungry for a snack, there is no proper choice. I want you to think about asking yourself why. If you're not physically hungry, what are you looking for? If you're not looking to satisfy hunger, what are you looking to satisfy? This takes some time, effort, and practice, but I promise you that this will pay dividends and benefits to you for years because we are permanently changing your response to stressors as opposed to always using food as that coping strategy, as that crutch, we're giving you step one, identifying step one, what your triggers are. Step two would be with intention replacing. Okay, I'm not hungry, let's say, but I really want those pretzels. Why? I need a break. Okay, take a break. Take a walk, go outside, listen to soothing music, do something that you find enjoyable or soothing that's separate and aside from food that handles the emotion. Um, so this is a, also a process that we will go over one-on-one -on -one individually with both myself and the psychologist. I think it's important to take a look at your relationship to food and understand when you're eating and hunger isn't the reason. Uh, oftentimes I see this most predominantly in the evening. You know, we eat just out of habit or for decompression, reward, for getting through a day, that kind of thing. Okay. So I'm putting up some tips on how to tell the difference. Sometimes we're confused. I'll ask uh, patients every day, why are you having that snack? And their immediate answer to me is because I'm hungry. And then I will stop them and say, well, but are you really? You just had a meal an hour or two before. And then when they think about it, they'll say, no, not hungry. I feel like it, I'm bored, I'm tired, you know, I'm happy, I'm sad, something else is going on. Um, if you're hungry, if you say you're hungry, true or not, permission granted, right? We're physically kind of cued to honor, biologically cued to honor physical hunger. So if you say, I'm hungry, you're eating. So I want you to be very careful with language, make sure you're telling yourself the truth, and here are some tips to tell the difference. So if you are physically hungry, physical hunger tends to have a physical basis. These are sensations. I'll ask, well, how does that hunger feel? What does that hunger feel like? And sometimes people will just tilt their head, and the reason that they're tilting their head is because it's not based in a feeling, it's based in a thought. Uh, so physical hunger has a physical sensation. It comes on gradually. This is not something that's immediate. It will be persistent. So if you hold off, let me try to delay this 15, 20 minutes. If it's physical hunger, you're still physically hungry. It's not going to go away. It will be satisfied by most foods. 
I call this the apple test. If you're physically hungry and I offer you an apple, you'll say, great, thank you so much. If you're not physically hungry, if you're just looking and I offer you an apple, you might go, mm, not really what I'm looking for, okay? Um, there might be some physical cues, stomach growling. Keep in mind though, for some of my post-op patients, uh, noise doesn't always equal hunger. Sometimes your stomach is just gonna make some noise. You wanna make sure it makes sense. Has time passed since my last meal? Does it make sense that this is physical hunger? When did I eat last? Um, and food satisfies that hunger. With emotional hunger, on the other hand, it has more of an emotional basis. It's more thought and head as opposed to physical sensation. Sometimes it can come on very suddenly. It will generally pass if ignored, uh, and it's for specific foods, so that apple will not do it, right? You're gonna want something else. There are generally no physical cues. It's more the emotional cue. I had a rough day. I'm a little anxious right now. I'm a little depressed. I'm a little, um, you know, sad or stressed. Uh, food doesn't always satisfy it. So even if you grab that, that sweet or salty snack, it doesn't do it. So you need more and you go back for another snack. And that leads to just kind of mindless, mindless eating. So those are some ways for you, if you're not sure, to tell the difference between physical hunger and, and head hunger. So what do you do that with it once you figure it out and say, okay, I'm eating for stress, I'm eating for boredom. Well, first off, distraction can help sometimes just to give yourself that hold on, wait a minute, stop sign in your, in your mind to say, let me just take a step back um, and do something else. I wanna make sure it's round hole, round peg. So let's say you, design, you figure out I'm stressed and I, I would really like a snack. I wanna make sure that the something else that you do helps your stress. You wanna make sure that if what you are feeling is the need for a reward or treat, that what you replace the food with for you is a treat or a reward. Otherwise, it really won't fit. So you wanna make sure that you are identifying your triggers to eat outside of physical hunger and replacing it with some other activity. I want you to think, what else can I do? Not what else can I eat that is better. Um, Long-term success really does lie in, in addressing this and controlling it. So to put it all together, if you're physically hungry, in between meals, a snack might be completely appropriate. Maybe I have lunch at 11.30, maybe I have dinner at six o'clock, it's 3.30 in the afternoon, I'm physically hungry, fantastic. We will have a conversation as to what you can, you can grab as a healthy, nourishing, satisfying, satiating snack. If you're not physically hungry, if you're looking, first figure out what am I looking for, what emotion am I looking to satisfy, then take that step to replace food. What am I gonna do instead? Just white knuckling it through, although admirable, is not enough. You have to take it that final step and put in place different coping strategies to make this a habit that sticks. That way, emotional eating is no longer a habit that you have, so there is nothing to fall back to in your times of stress. So I want you to think about those things. Step two, eating intuitively. Mind, body, sensations of physical hunger and satiety and paying attention. Pull this uh, scale up anytime you need it. If you'd like a copy of it, I'd be happy to send it over to you. I know a lot of patients stick it on their refrigerator just as a mental cue to, uh, to pay attention to this intuitive sensation. The more you practice now, the easier it will be for you after surgery, I promise. And we'll go in greater depth when we meet individually one-on-one -on -one or in the group classes. Thanks for joining me.